Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Alpenheim, and today we'll be discussing the importance of scholarship opportunities for minority students with special guests. Pierre Blake, Executive Director of the Jack and Jill Foundation of America in Washington, D.C. Kim Hunter, Chairman and CEO of the LeGrant Foundation in Los Angeles, and Ed Alvarez, Chairman of the Board of the Latino Education Advancement Foundation, which is located in the Bay Area of California. Thank you all for joining. It's just wonderful to see you here. And I'm so looking forward to this conversation. And, you know, one of the things that I really think is is so fantastic about my job is I get to listen to people who are way smarter than me in different topics, and I get to learn from you. So, Pierre, could you please help me learn, help help to educate me? I grew up, as, as you and I talked about, in uh, uh, before the program started. I grew up uh, exposed to the Jack and Jill organization. Uh, the foundation, of course, is, the, is your philanthropic arm um, through a, a very good friend of mine whose family was very, very um, influenced and benefited from the work of the Jack and Jill organization. Talk a little bit about the, the foundation, the philanthropic arm, and also uh, give us a little history of, of the organization, how it was founded, and its its modern form. Sure. So the membership side of Jack and Jill, and good afternoon, good morning um, to all of us, and thank you for allowing me to have this opportunity to share about Jack and Jill and Jack and Jill Foundation um, and talking about how we support African-American communities and keep our vision of transforming these communities one child at a time. So Jack and Jill of America Incorporated is a membership organization that started in the late 1930s. And it started from um, a very good friend of my family, Mary Ann Stubbs Thomas is one of the mothers that started in Philadelphia. That was one of the first chapters. That was the first chapter. And basically her husband was um, a physician and she wanted her children to be in connection with other physician families, professional families in this area of Germantown, Philadelphia, to be able to, you know, go and have tea with one another when they couldn't go to the restaurant down the street and have tea because they were not allowed to as um, African Americans. So they started an organization so they would be able to do um, and teach their children word worlds of um whether it's financial literacy and Jack and Joe works in different modules of how they teach their children. So it's financial literacy, education, and the importance of philanthropy. And then the foundation was born out of that membership in 1968 during the civil rights and Jack and Joe members were giving to majority organizations such as um, American Red Cross, um, infantile paralysis, which is now March of Dimes. And they were giving large sums of money. $40,000 in the 1930s is, you know, hundreds of thousand dollars now. So at that time, they wanted to direct their funding to African-American children and families because we um, were, you know, mostly the recipients and those that were um, caused harm because of, you know, infantile paralysis and our homes were being burned and not able to have organizations to support us. So they started their own foundation. When you know better, you do better. So you start a found, they started a foundation in 1968 to help those African-American children and families. And we support all other communities outside of Jack and Jill chapters. And we use our chapters to be our ears on the ground because we are in 250 um, communities across the country with chapters. And so we have rely on them to be our ears on the ground and see what is needed and how the foundation can support those underserved communities. And we do and this that. Is, this is about this is about using strength, right? Uh, using strength, you, absolutely. It's basically galvanizing the strength of the community, being empowered where where perhaps you're confronting issues of disempowerment, but taking that power and wedging yourself into a place where you are supplying your own solution, I guess, Ed, you've got the same kind of an approach at the uh, Latino um, uh, um, uh, uh, Education Advancement Foundation, right? Yeah, correct. And you can refer to us as LEAF. It's much easier to uh, to identify. Uh, and yeah, we have a, 
we have established a uh, our LEAF Center for College Success, which is not a traditional scholarship program. What we do is we support uh, 150 rising seniors, 150 first-year college students, and 150 second-year college students. Uh, and we provide uh, our college students with a $500 a semester uh, scholarship for four semesters. Um, and, uh, and we match them with peer near-peer mentors, uh, mentors that attended the same high schools they did, who are now uh, juniors and seniors in college. And we provide the mentors with a $500 uh, semester stipend for, uh, for their mentorship work. And then lastly, we engage their parents and we provide the parents with a $250 uh, semester uh, stipend as long as they participate in workshops. Um, and so we take this, this group uh, and, and complement uh, the work that we're doing with um, social emotional. We have a partner a health clinic. And, um, and so we provide them with access to the health clinic. And we provide them with a career exploration and discovery advisor. So you know, we've tried to wrap all that around into, uh, into a program that, um, that we're finding some pretty good success uh, with this first year. We'll have, uh, we'll have retained uh, 80% of our four-year students and 70% of our community college students. We try to keep a balance of community college and uh, four-year college at 50-50 uh, and for a number of different reasons. But, uh, but that's our program. Uh, we try to wrap, wrap everything we can uh, to provide the support they need. And then, uh, and then we have an emergency fund. This, this past year, uh, we averaged about $250 per student uh, emergency purposes. Uh, I think you mentioned earlier uh, the rent, the uh, car insurance, whatever it is. And we can directly attribute uh, uh, a number of students staying in school because we provided them with this emergency fund. Uh, because low-income students obviously uh, have enough challenges uh, without having to uh, address, uh, solve those problems while they're in school. So if we can help, help them solve the problems, then, uh, then uh, they continue on. So, um, so that's what we're doing, and, and that's the approach we're taking. And I think it's so interesting that you're both talking about a long-term approach, a, an approach that really goes over decades, right? And and it's a sustained support uh, to, in order to solve a problem that has been a sustained problem. Uh, Kim, talk a little bit about about your foundation because you also, again, you're you're taking energy and you're converting it into services. You're converting that energy into change again in a sustained basis. Kim, uh, give us a give us a quick overview. And then let's let's talk about this whole idea of wraparound uh, versus codependence, right? Understanding that there's a problem, right? And dealing with all of its dimensions as opposed to just thinking that you can write a check and walk away. Well, first, the LeGrand Foundation's mission, we are celebrating our 24th anniversary this year, and we have four pillars. Scholarship is just one of the four pillars. So scholarship, career development, professional workshops is number two. Three is talent acquisition. So I have a strong point of view, and my board supports that, and that is I can provide a scholarship to a racially diverse kid all day long, but if what's the purpose if they graduate and don't have a job? So talent acquisition is the, probably the number one focus that I have probably in the last seven years. And the fourth one is mentorship. So those are the four pillars. So we're very, very defined of our responsibilities and what we offer. Now, the unique thing about the LeGrand Foundation, unlike my two other colleagues, is my focus is for racial groups. So African-Americans is one, Latino, Hispanic is number two, number three is uh, Asian Pacific Islanders, and number four is Native Americans. Now, the reason for all of this is because it's all focusing in advertising, PR, and marketing. So if you're an engineer major or architect major or poli sci or anthropology or, or sociology, that is not what we do. We focus specifically, it's very narrow on advertising, PR, and marketing is because I built my career of 40 years. And when you look at the lack of racial diversity in my industry, it's woefully underrepresented. So I made a decision to start something. Well, plus it's intersectional, right? I mean, this whole idea of communication and 
being able to connect across different industries, right? Communication is, if you're in the sciences, there's communication involved. If you're in civil society in the nonprofit sector in government, or if you're in banking, there's always this communication uh, piece that is involved. And what you're doing is you're basically taking an overarching topic and, 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 uh, and focusing there. You know, it's it, it's all part of the the entire um, fabric of, of of our economic uh, system. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this idea of wraparound and meeting people where they are and making sure that they're successful. Uh, Pierre, um, let, let's go around one more time. Could you comment a little bit about that idea of not it's not sufficient to just write a check? You were talking about the whole idea of creating a social, you know, people coming together at the very beginning just to have tea, right? I mean, that whole idea of people meeting and collaborating and talking and dealing with common problems and finding common solutions, that's part of what you've been about since your founding as well. And Ed, it's the same thing for you, right? This this whole idea of if you're going to solve things, you first have to talk about what the problems are. You have to come together. And it's not just about $150 check or $500 check. Uh, uh, right here? Correct. So um, the foundation works in, um, so we're a very small staffed office. So we work with a lot of collaborators. So we collaborate with UNCF and UNCF helps administer our scholarships. And we also have a scholarship that's um, called the Jacqueline Moore Bowles Scholarship through UNCF that is specifically for communications and marketing um, mm -hmm. students in their junior and senior, senior years to help them get through college, because that's what we all want, right? We want them to get to and through college. And so the other part that foundation does, we have our HBCU gap fund and our gap fund helps support those students in their senior year that might have that emergency or last minute financial need to get over that last hurdle to actually graduate. And we found that happens and it's about 700 to a thousand dollars that some of those students need. So we work with all of those chapters across the country to help us raise that money to um, support and graduate students. And we've graduated about a thousand students just from the inception of this um, college gap fund since 2019 and um, given out more than $600,000 to about 11 um, HBCUs. And our goal is to have um, $2 million given out in within 10 years. So that is in 2029 to be able to um, support students, um, to basically to increase the number of students graduating from HBCUs. And our resources that we use with UNCF is that collaboration to do that as well. And do you have a similar approach to peers where, where you're uh, tracking um, a you make yourself accountable for the success that your programs generate, where you're tracking it, you're reporting on it, you're discussing it, and you're changing course if you find that it's not successful. How do you how do you deal with accountability in LEAF? It's pretty it's pretty simple, actually. Uh, <clears throat> we're accountable to our funders. Our program, obviously, is an ex it's an expensive program. And so uh, we're fortunate to have uh, uh, two or three foundations that are supporting us. And so uh, the metrics uh, that we have to create and uh, and um, provide are directly related to uh, the data that we're accumulating uh, as a result of, uh, of this con close contact we have with students. We have, uh, we survey their, them regularly. We survey their parents. We survey the mentors. We accumulate all this data and, and try to, uh, try to uh, uh, communicate it in a way that uh, that uh, others can can uh, take advantage of and 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 distribute that information. You know, we started this we started this program because at least in our particular area uh, of San Jose, uh, some eighty percent of all low income students are going directly into minimum wage jobs. 
and Kim talked about talent acquisition, and we we feel the same way. And that is that that uh, creating upward social economic mobility is what we have to focus on. So we have to draw these kids out uh, and get them, in our case, get them into community college uh, because so many of them are not prepared for a four-year college. And that's why we've been insistent with our funders who wanted us to focus on four-year schools uh, that uh, that uh, we needed to, uh, to provide room for community college students who are on their way up. So that's, that's what uh, that that's where our ac- accountability point. comes from. That's such an important point, Ed. The difference between somebody who has a minimum wage job and somebody who has a much higher wage job is not intelligence. It's just not. It's opportunity, it's education, it's skills that can be learned, right? But when you look at how jobs are are structured in this in this economy, everything today, we're we're in a knowledge economy. We call it a knowledge economy for a reason. What you're saying is let's focus on opening those doors through these types of programs, right, Ed? Exactly, exactly. And and uh, there's there's so much, uh, you know, there's an unlimited amount of work. We have the other issue in California, uh, in particular in, in Silicon Valley, where where um, uh, schools are, are funded disproportionate to the need. And 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 so uh, we have uh, we have, for example, in Silicon Valley, uh, high schools that are that are supported by property tax receive twenty four thousand dollars per per student uh, a year. Our students receive fourteen thousand dollars. So there's a ten thousand dollar difference in uh, per student in uh, providing the services that are needed to uh, to get them uh, to where they need to be. And, and, and a lot of it has to do with the wraparound support that uh, that we're talking about. We're trying to communicate that to school districts that, that there needs to be this additional support and understanding of the challenges that these kids face. Right. So what you're saying is in places where there's low income but high population density, you've got a school funding mechanism that systematically disadvantages those school districts. Kim, um, how do you see this whole idea of this minimum wage job opportunity versus education providing um, uh, opportunity to go beyond um, those minimum wage jobs and, and start to break that cycle? Well, I'm a big proponent of there's a direct correlation between being a highly educated um, workforce versus not being highly educated. I'm a product of the inner city of Philadelphia. I'm one of 11 children. I'm the only one with a college education. I'm one of the few with a high school diploma. And so I clearly see the direct correlation. Now, I want to be real clear. The mission of the foundation that I created 24 years ago is not need based. Right. It's elastic because there is, I believe, based on my experience and based on the research, it's mutually exclusive. You can be highly, un, literally highly unfinancially support like my family. They didn't have the resources to send me to college. But yet, if you were academically sound and had the resources at, available, you sought those resources to apply to college and move through um, society. So I truly believe you may not have the resources, but if you have some of the fundamentals, we take you on and we build that infrastructure for you. So there's a direct correlation between education and income. Let me let me get this straight. So um, does that mean that you only take on students who um, have passed a threshold of of accomplishment before you you bring them into your program, or do you do you take some of the most difficult to serve people. How do, how do you make those determinations, uh, Kim? It's, it's, an, it's an application. So you have to meet the requirements of the application. So our school focus is four year or grad. So it's undergrad and graduate school. So those are our two focus areas. And you must have a 3.0 GPA in order to apply for the scholarship. Right. And, and uh, Ed, you don't, you don't take quite that approach, do you? No, not at all. I mean, you know, we're on the other the other side of it. We're, we're, we're looking for students that we know, given the opportunity, are going to succeed in college. And, and that's why we start with this community college approach that uh, we know if we can support them and, and create a uh, there's a lack of a handoff 
uh, for students from high school to college. And, and so we try to address that lack of the handoff, get involved in, in the middle there, and, uh, and, then, and then create a situation where they can look at, uh, at uh, credential programs, they can look at uh, uh, everything that's available in, in the workforce and, and, and start thinking about guided pathways. Uh, guided pathways to to a job of some sort that that meets their needs, and so and this applies at the four year college as well. We have many many students who are already uh, ready to graduate in uh, four year college. Either they chose the wrong major, or they really didn't know why they were there, and uh, and they need help. And uh, and 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 so that you know we try to we try to address that at the different levels that they're at, but, uh, but it's, it's based on, uh, on the fact that uh, they need the opportunity and we can provide them the support. Um, I have a question for you all. Um, uh, since I'm coming from Germany, you know, Europe and uh, Germany in particular, for example, school is free. Mm-hmm. Um, so is the equivalent of co- community college. And so is the equivalent of college and um, higher education is free. It's free because um, everyone is seen as a strategic resource for society, right? You want everybody to be educated. Um, are we just, in effect, sticking our fingers in the dike? Um, and and are, we, are we trying to make up for something that we as a society are just not in, investing uh, sufficient amounts to do, which is to have a uh, educated populace uh, peer? What do you, what do you think uh, about that whole question? Oh, I do. I think that as a society, we need to look at, you know, improving our economy. And we can't do that without having educated, educated, an educated society. You know, we need to make sure that our students are graduating high school with all the opportunities to get them to a higher education. And to be able to do that, it starts locally. It needs really to be sustained in your local communities. And that's Part of what we use with our Jack and Jill chapters as well for this HBCU College Gap Fund, we know that these students have that opportunity if given the opportunity. They, they too come from families that might not have a parent that even understands how to advocate for them to get to college because they've never had that. So I do believe that as a society, we need to educate our students, make sure that our schools are um, properly funded to be able to have, everyone has the same opportunity. I, I don't know much about the European system, but I do know that there are some countries that have free education, free college for their um for the their um, people that live in their country. So, uh, Ed, Kim, you want to weigh in on this on this issue? Well, the only thing I would add is that um, you know we feel very strongly that uh, on, uh, our resources have to also be dedicated to the parents. The parents need to better understand the system and and how they navigate their children through the system. Um, uh, my parents didn't go to college, uh, didn't graduate from high school. Uh, and so, um, you know, I didn't have the type of background information that I needed. So we're trying to provide that to to the same group of parents uh, where they they understand and they understand careers. Uh, there's all kinds of data relating to their influence on uh, career selection with their with their children and and um, and the misinformation that they have about careers, engineering, doctor, or whatever it is. So so yeah, our focus is with with uh, with parents to engage them in this process and keep them engaged. Kim, what do you think the return on investment is on every child being educated? Oh, as I said from the very beginning, I have no illusion. Education is the number one priority. Um, Ed Ed and I both live in the state of California. And what baffles me, and I'm not from here. I was born and raised back east, born and raised where Jack and Jill was founded in Philadelphia. And I moved from Philadelphia to Seattle, Seattle, L.A., L.A., Minneapolis. And I will tell you, it astounds me being the wealthiest state in the union that when you look at K through 12, California is ranked at the bottom five. Why? Because we are our elected officials 
and people are not making education a priority. Here in just LA, LA County, just the LA Unified School District, 67 of Latinos, 67% of Latinos don't even graduate from high school. 47% of African Americans do not graduate from high school. I, as an employer, I, as a business person, say there's a huge gap there. There's a problem, and we need to solve this problem. And this has been going on for decades in the 35 years I've lived here in California. So do I believe there's a direct correlation between education and economic development? Unequivocally. Do I believe there's a direct correlation between education and success? Unequivocally. Do I believe there's a direct correlation between education and having a healthy lifestyle? Unequivocally. So I'm a big advocate of education. Do we have an advocacy issue across society? In other words, at this point in time, given the clarity of what you all are saying, there it seems that we have two challenges. First of all, um, within all of society, we ought to we ought to be thinking about how do we solve this problem as Americans across different groups. Mm -hmm. But within each of the groups, there's also this this dialogue that needs to take place. Right. As it has happened with with uh, Jack and Jill, as it has happened with um, with Leaf and, and other organizations. And of course, the grant is, is part of that. If if society is going to solve the problem as a whole, if we can't come together, to solve the problem as a whole, each group has to figure out a way to solve it for itself. We can't just wait for for America to coalesce and everybody to hold hands and, and sing songs together, we actually have to have to get moving. Uh, Pierre, Ed and, and Kim, how, how do you see that in terms of the advocacy work that you do to galvanize action, not only to create uh, funding opportunities for each of your organizations, but also to create a, a movement to, to build movement within each of those communities and across America for change. Pierre, and then we're, we're going to go to uh, Pierre, Ed, and then Kim, we're going to give you the last word. So I, I believe in collaboration. We can't do this alone. And um, as I stated, we're a small office sitting in Washington, D.C., trying to talk to the United States of America, and it doesn't it doesn't happen. So it is strongly um, a collaborative effort with Jack and Jill chapters and also with our funding partners. So we have funding partners with um, our college gap fund, that's Natural Grocers. And we also have a law firm called Major Lindsay in Africa that have supported um, college students at HBCUs and those that are interested in going into law. So it is truly a collaboration that we have to um, set goals for ourselves and set the criteria and make the demands. So, thank you. Aside and apart from our college program, we're in the process of, um, of receiving funding to, uh, to create a specific advocacy, advocacy strategic plan and to engage uh, the city, uh, the county, and the state in that process, all of whom uh, have money and, uh, and, and we want to have a say-so on how they spend that money. And that, that's uh, through advocacy. Uh, and, and approaching school board members and, and community-based organizations uh, and uh, providing information as to what the you know, scope and nature of this problem is. You know, we've just asked a number of questions. And before I give you the last word, Kim, I just wanted to, to, to uh, just quickly go through the answers. The first question was, how many people have had personal experience either through themselves or their family or, or, or friends? And 88% of respondents said that they had personal experience with some sort of scholarship of the type that, that you all um, uh, uh, advance. And then we, we talked about how essential it is. And uh, again, over 80% thought that it was very essential. But the third question was really interesting. We said scholarships are designed to fund um, to fund education. Is there another solution than these private scholarships? And it was interesting. We have a balanced uh, answer. Most people said we need to increase public funding, but there were also uh, people who said, uh, leave the current system alone. So it's either leave the current system alone or increase public funding. I have a third uh, answer. We have to change. 
Each and every one of us has to change. Each and every one of us has to think it's important. And if we think it's important, we'll either fund publicly, we'll fund privately, we'll figure it out. We will act as if education is a first priority for our kids. What do you think, uh, Kim? What is what is uh, our solution to this from an advocacy point of view to fix this problem? Because this is really stupid that we have such a, a, a great country and we leave so much talent on the sidelines. And if education is key, why are we not educating everybody? Well, I'll just um, reiterate um, the two words that both Pierre and Ed said, uh, and they're spot on. And that is advocacy and collaboration. None of this, none of us, none of our organizations can do this independently. We are partnered with many of the Fortune 500s. We are partnered with many of the top 10 advertising PR firms. And we are partnered with donors that give back our alum. And we have a deep relationship with our alum over the last 24 years. I have no illusion we cannot do this by ourselves, but advocacy and collaboration are key. Well, this is this has just been so uh, such an important discussion. I'd like to personally thank you as as a white guy who's hosting this. You have helped me to understand this topic uh, to a greater extent. Pierre Blake, Executive Director, Jack and Jill Foundation of America in Washington D.C. Kim Hunter, Chairman and CEO of the Legrand Foundation in Los Angeles, and Ed Alvarez, Chair of the Board of the Latino Education Advancement Foundation or LEAF in, in the Bay Area of, of California. Uh, thank you so much. And, and and thanks so much for your patience as you help me to understand uh, a little bit more about how we deal with this really important problem. Frankly, I want as an employer, as somebody who uh, who uh, undertakes executive search for civil society organizations, I want as many talented people out there, educated, engaged, leading these organizations in America can all, only good can come of it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you. Attendees, for, for coming and, and everyone have a great day. Stay safe. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.